trying to get away from me. Oh, perfect. Thank you. You're a lifesaver. Okay, I'll get started. <laughs> Last couple of classes, we've talked about uh, electric flux and we've talked about electrical potential. Uh, we've learned to think of electrical charges as sources or kind of faucets of electrical field, electrical field lines, uh, and also drains, sinks of electrical field in electrical field lines. It's a new way of visualizing electricity. We've also learned to think about charges as hills in an electrostatic potential landscape and also valleys in an electrostatic landscape. That's again a new way of thinking about electricity. Uh, the reason that we started to think about charges as faucets and drains and hills and valleys is because we need to think this way, we need to use these tools to to solve the problems that we're going to be exploring, examining over the next four classes up until the test. So we're going to be looking at applications of electricity, we're going to be looking at um, capacitors, looking at resistors, looking at batteries, building circuits from capacitors, resistors and batteries. And to understand electricity in that context, we'll need to use these tools of electrical potential and electrical flux. So today is all about capacitors and what we call capacitance that characterizes capacitors. I want to go through these topics. I want to talk about the meaning of capacitance. I want to talk about a, a particular capacitor called a parallel plate capacitor. Um, I want to talk about arrangements, assemblies of capacitors, uh, assemblies and arrangements where the capacitors are in what we call parallel and series to one another. And then I want to look at energy stored in capacitors. So those are the topics for today. Before I start those topics, I just want to make one remark that is important for today's class and is important for our later classes that lead up to test one. Um, we talked about conductors and we said that a, a conductor in equilibrium is kind of this landscape of zero electrical field. Inside a conductor in equilibrium, uh, the electrical field everywhere is zero. That means that inside a conductor in equilibrium, not just the electrical field is zero, but the electrical potential, which is related to the field, that has to be constant. And so a electrical conductor is a uh, electrical landscape where in equilibrium, the electrical field inside the conductor is zero and the electrical potential throughout the conductor is constant. It's, it's a little bit like, below the figure is a, a photograph of a plateau, an earthly plateau. So everywhere on that earthly plateau, uh, the elevation is constant and the uh, gravitational potential is constant and our conductors are like that. Their sort of electrical elevation, their electrical potential is constant everywhere over their, uh, over their volume. And we'll use that today and we'll use that uh, more in the next classes. Okay, so let's get on to capacitors, capacitance. Let's, let me describe what a capacitor is, uh, the concept of it. Let me define an equation for a capacitance so that we can quantify it. So capacitors are 
just to give you an idea, they're, they're used in electrical circuits. So your iPhone has a, a large number of capacitors. It helps it, for example, receive your um, cellular signals. So th that's one place we use capacitors. Capacitors are used to um, uh, detect uh, motion. For example, on an iPad, when you write on an iPad, that's using capacitance of your iPad. So that capacitors are common, very common ingredients in electrical circuits. Um, we're actually full of capacitors, you and I, uh, and neurons are capacitors. Uh, we charge them up, that's activating them when they fire and discharge them. So uh, we're full of capacitors. Um, the earth, over the surface of the earth, is full of capacitors being charged up and discharged. Thunderclouds are the classic example. They're giant capacitors and you're seeing them discharge uh, when there's lightning. Okay, so that's a, a, a description of capacitors. What they really do, you know, whether they're the neur neurons in your head or the capacitors in the iPhone or the thunderclouds, there's they're storing charge and they're storing electrical energy. So capacitors store charge and they store electrical energy. Um, the degree to which they can store charge and energy is characterized by a quantity called capacitance. And that's that symbol here, C. And we measure that capacitance in units that are called farads, and that's this symbol here, F. So uh, the capacitance, C, in farads, tells us how able this or that capacitor, a neuron, a thundercloud, um, a, a, a capacitor in an iPhone, is able to store charge in energy. It characterizes that. Okay, so here's a, a sketch of a capacitor. It has the key ingredients of a capacitor. Let me just walk through them. So firstly, a capacitor consists of two, two conductors, two separated conductors. So that all the capacitors we'll look at today involve two conductors, two separated conductors that we're going to charge up. Uh, equal sizes on opposite signs, so plus or minus, of charge are placed on the two plates of the capacitor, the two cut conductors of the capacitor. So we charge them up with plus Q and, and minus Q. Um, that um, electrical charge that we placed on the two plates of the conductors, that will create a, um, an, an electrical landscape in the environment of the two conductors, in the environment of the two plates. So if you visualize that landscape, you can visualize the lines of field that will flow from the, the positively charged plate to the negatively charged plate. So we could see, sort of see that stream of field lines from one plate to the other plate. We could also uh, imagine the two plates as a hill and a valley. So the positively charged plate is a potential hill. The negatively charged plate is a potential valley. And we could look at the contours of that electrostatic landscape between the, between the two plates. So the, there's a landscape of field and potential between the two plates. Um, and as I say, ultimately, whether it's you know, in, our, in our brain and neurons, uh, or it's in a circuit and capacitors, uh, they're storing charge, they're storing, they're storing energy. Uh, you can see they're storing charge, there's charge on the plates, but they're also storing energy in the establishment of this electrostatic landscape, the field and the potential. Okay. So <clears throat> let's define capacitance. So over here, I've got a sketch of a typical capacitor. So the typical capacitor has two metal conductors. So there's one on the left here, one on the right here. And they are separated. So there's some separation between these two conductors. And I'm going to charge them up. I'm going to charge them up, put positive charge on one plate, put negative charge on the other plate by attaching them to the terminals of this battery down here. So the um, plate on the left becomes positively charged because it's attached to the positive terminal of the battery. That actually means that 
swarms of electrons have run off that conducting plate towards the battery and the, the plate on the right becomes negatively charged because it's attached to the negative ter terminal. That means that um, swarms of electrons have swarmed on to the negative plate to make it, it, it negatively charged. As a result, there's a potential, electric potential between the two plates. That's an electrical landscape that we've just established. So, we define the capacitance by this equation up here, or this graph down here. Let me walk through the graph. Let me, let's just imagine that we, we're in the lab, we set up this little arrangement of the battery and the, um, and the capacitor, and we're going to slowly, however we do it, slowly charge up the capacitor, and we're going to observe the voltage between the plates of the capacitor. So that's what this graph shows. Horizontally here is the charge on the plates of the capacitor. Now, this is the positive, the amount of positive charge on the positive plate, or it could be the amount of negative charge on the negative plate. I'm just thinking about the sizes of the charges on the two plates. So uh, we start with no charge on the plates, and then we increase it, increase it, and increase it. Now, vertically, I'm going to watch the electrical potential between the two plates. It's a potential difference. Sometimes I call it just a potential, but it is a potential difference. So I'm going to watch that potential uh, as I charge up the capacitor, and we see, that, look at this blue line here. This describes me charging up the capacitor and the potential difference that arises. And as I add more charge, I get more potential. More charge, more potential. The charge and the potential are in proportion to one another. And so that's the basis of this equation up here for a capacitor that charge and potential are proportional to one another, and the proportionality constant is the capacitance. So if you look at this equation up here, here's the vertical axis of my graph, the potential. Here's the um, uh, horizontal axis of my graph, the charge, and here's a proportionality constant between the two, capacitance. Now, because this is, I, I don't know what, exactly why this happened, um, but it's, we don't multiply by the uh, capacitance here. We, we divide on, in this equation by a capacitance. So the slope of this graph is in inverse proportion to the capacitance. Uh, that means that um, this graph would be shallower for a large, cap large capacitance. You'd be dividing by a large number. That, that means that for a large capacitance, you can put a lot of charge on the plates and not change the potential very much. On the other hand, for a small capacitance, right, this, this graph would be a, a, a steeper slope. It would be this one over here on the left-hand side. This is a small capacitance. That means that if we put just a little vol uh, charge on the place of the small capacitance, we get a rather, rather large potential difference. Anyway, this gives us this master equation. I, I call this the master equation for a capacitance, right? Uh, master equation for a capacitor. It's the relationship between the charge on the plates, the potential between the plates, and the capacitance of that capacitor. It defines capacitance for us. It's just Q over V is how we say it. Here's just a, a, a little example of how we, um, how we might calculate the capacitance of our capacitor. So, Maybe I, I measured that I, I applied 36 nanocoulombs of positive charge to the left-hand plate, 36 nanocoulombs of negative charge to the right-hand plate, and I got a 12-volt potential between the two plates. Knowing that charge on the plates, knowing that potential between the plates, I can quickly figure out what the capacitance of this particular capacitor is. All I've got to do is divide the charge on the plates by the potential between the plates. I'm just taking the size of the charge on the plates, not worrying about the signs. 36 nanocoulombs. Just taking the, um, the voltage difference between the plates. I'm not worried about you know, which plates higher potential, which plates lower potential, just the size. So dividing one by the other, and that gives me uh, 36 times, uh, times 12 is um, 
Gosh, I need to go back to, um, I mean, maybe kindergarten or elementary school. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you. I was looking at this and thinking, well, why doesn't this times this equal that? Um, but yeah, you're right, it's divide. Um, 36 divided by 12 is 3. Um, it is 3 times 10 to the minus 9 farads, the units of capacitance. So there's a little example, and I could barely do that. OK, let's get on to um, a particular form of capacitor. It's called a parallel plate capacitor. So this is a, a special design of capacitor that is one that is um, easy to visualize, easy to think about. And in fact, it was a parallel plate capacitor in my, in my last example. So here's a parallel plate capacitor. And I'm going to list all the characteristics in a design of a parallel plate capacitor. So a parallel plate capacitor consists of two parallel plates, two parallel sheets of conductor. There's one upstairs here in orange. There's one downstairs here in blue. They are separated by some distance. They've got to be separated. And that distance is described here uh, by this uh, variable, this quantity I've called d. It's the plate separation. Uh, those two plates have some cross-section to them, some area to them that they're going to store the charge on. And that area, it's the same for the top plate and the bottom plate, that area, I've given that the symbol A. So those are the two quantities, A and D, separation and area, that describe a parallel plate capacitor. That parallel plate capacitor then is able to store charge. We can see it's storing charge on the top and bottom plates here. Uh, and consequently, a potential arises. We can see this potential arising over here on the, um, on the left-hand side. The question that I'm posing in this overhead is, what is the capacitance of this capacitor? What is the capacitance of this parallel capacitor? How does it depend on your design? How does it depend on the plate separation? How does it depend on the plate areas? Well, there's an, the beauty of the parallel plate capacitor is there's a simple equation for its capacitance in terms of the plate area, terms of the plate separation. And so that's why we often think about parallel plate capacitors. Here it is. This equation down here is the capacitance on the left of a parallel plate capacitor. You see uh, the symbol A, that's the area of the capacitor's plates. You see the symbol D, that's the uh, separation between the capacitor's plates. And you see a constant epsilon naught, we met it before, <coughs> associated with electricity um, that determines the capacitance of the capacitor. So this equation tells you some important things, right? Firstly, the, the capacitance of our parallel plate capacitor depends on the geometry of the capacitor. It depends how big we made it, small we made it. Specifically, it depends on the separation between the plates and the area of the plates. Even more specifically, it says that it's proportional to the area of the plate. So if you have big plates in a capacitor, that's a lot of space to store charge, that's a big capacitance. It's able to store a lot of charge. If you have large separation between the plates, you have large separation between the plates, that's, that D is in the denominator. That will make a small capacitance. That's because if you have large separation between the plates, you've got to make a landscape, an electrical landscape of electrical fields that stretches a long way between the plates. You've got to make a, a contour of electrical potential that stretches a long way between the, the plates, and that makes the capacitance small. Establishing that landscape is the penalty, and that makes the capacitance small. So uh, the capacitor's capacitance is proportional to the area, inversely proportional to the separation. OK, quiz question. Okay, so we're at 950. I'll give us to 953.
This question asks us to imagine three capacitors, left, center, and right. Uh, they're all three parallel plate capacitors, but they have different uh, areas to their plates, and they have different separations between their plates. And we've got to um, pick out which capacitance is the largest and which capacitance is the smallest and, and order them. Um, so, you know, just to be clear, um, the second capacitor here seems to have a smaller plate separation than the other two. And then the third capacitor here, that seems to have um, a, a smaller plate area than the other two. So that's the key feature. Capacitor number two has a smaller plate separation, and capacitor number three has a smaller, smaller plate area. And we've just got to rank them. Who's, who's the biggest capacitance and who's the smallest capacitance? Okay, let's talk about the answer. Um, we said that big area is big capacitance. We said that small plate separation is bigger capacitance. So if we want to look for the um, big capacitor in this herd of capacitors, let's look for the big plate area. Let's look for the um, small plate separation. Well, when I look here, it's this guy. It's got as big a plate area as any other capacitor, and it's got the smaller plate separation than any other capacitor. So C2 is the biggest capacitance. If I wanted to look for the smallest capacitance in the herd, so if I want to look for the smallest capacitance, what would I be looking for? I'd be looking for small plate area, that means small capacitance, and large plate separation. That means small capacitance. Uh, that's number three. It has the smallest area of the herd and has a big plate separation. So it goes C2, C1, C3. I hope that's OK. Any questions on that? OK, good. I mean, not good there's no questions, but uh, good that everybody's very happy with that. Um, Here's another example of parallel plate capacitor. This time it's a quantitative example. I'm just going to go through and do a few calculations related to a parallel plate capacitor. We're told we've applied uh, three volts to a parallel plate capacitor. We're told the, uh, the, the geometry of the parallel plate capacitor. We're told the area of the plates are two square centimeters. The separation between the plates is one millimeter. And we've got to find several things about it. Uh, what is its capacitance? Uh, how much charge is it storing? What is the electrical field between the plates of the capacitor? So we're going to figure out these three things. Uh, so if you want to imagine this capacitor, remember its plate area is two, two uh, square centimeters. So, you know, on each side it's going to be like this, a little square like this, kind of like a, um, uh, a, a penny, maybe a little bit larger than a penny. 
Um, and the plate separation is one millimeter, so that's about the thickness of a penny. So think about a penny, but think about having a skin on top of the penny and below the penny that is the plates of the capacitor. How much capacitance does it have? How much charge does it store if you apply three volts to the penny-shaped capacitor? And what is the field between the plates? That's kind of interesting. Uh, I'm going to do this on the um, device they don't know the name of. Here we are. So I pre-drew uh, the, the capacitor. And I added to the picture, I annotated the picture with the parameters that I was told, the geometry of the capacitor A and D, and the voltage between the plates. Uh, so this would be if I, uh, I'm in the physics test one, uh, and the first thing I would do would draw this out before I, go, I went ahead and, and solved the problem. The first question is what is the, what is the capacitance? Well, capacitance of our parallel plate capacitor is epsilon naught electric permeativity of free space times the area of the plates divided by the separation between the plates. So the electric permeativity uh, has a value that's 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 12. There's various ways you can write the units, but a really handy way of writing the units are in farads per meter when you're working with capacitances. So that's the way I'm going to write the units here. Um, I'm going to multiply it by the ratio of the uh, area to the plate separation. The area is 2 times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared. Remember, it was 2 centimeters squared. And the plate separation is 1 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. Remember, it was 1 millimeter. And if we multiply all these things together, of course, I've already done this, is 1.77 times 10 to the minus 12 farads, and that's a um, 10 to the minus 12 of a farad is a picofarad. So I'll just write it like that. OK. Second part of the question is what is the, what is the charge on the plates of the capacitor. So it's positive charge on one plate, ne negative charge on the pl other plate. What is the size of that charge? Um, I'm going to just use that master equation for a capacitor. Remember we define capacitance as C equals Q over V. So I'm just going to use that equation. I'm going to write it as Q equals CV. Uh, because I want the charge, and I know the capacitance, and I know the voltage, but it, this is just that uh, defining equation for capacitance. I just got to fill in what my capacitance is. It's um, 1.77 picofarads. I've got to multiply it by 3 volts. And if I go ahead and do that, I get uh, 5.31 picocoulombs, the, the units of charge. I've got uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs of charge on my um, little old capacitor. Final question, number three, or part three. I hope this is visible. <laughs> um, what is the electrical field between the plates? Oh, I mean, how am I going to do this? I haven't talked about electrical field. I've got to think back to the last class. I've got to think back to that relationship between electrical potential, that, that contours of elevation of electrical landscape, and electrical field, those, those lines, those trails uh, that run down the electrical uh, potential hills to the electrical potential valleys. Um, if you remember from last class, we said that the el electrical field is the negative slope of the electrical potential. So let's use that. Now, I'm just going to, I'm only going to worry about the size of the electrical field. So I'm not going to worry about the negative in the negative slope. But the electrical field size is going to be um, the slope 
of the electrical potential. The slope of the electrical potential from the top plate to the bottom plate, or vice versa, is the change in potential divided by the change in position. So it's the, the potential 3 volts divided by the um, separation of the plates, which is 1 millimeter. And so all I got to do is divide 3 volts by 1 millimeter, 10 to the minus 3 meters, and that's going to give me uh, the electrical field between the plates. Comes out to be a large number. It says 3 kilovolts, 3,000 volts per meter. And we solved that problem. So that's an example of working with um, a parallel plate capacitor and figuring out, um, in this case, we figured out the capacitance of the parallel plate capacitor from the geometry, from its geometry. That determines its ability to store charge. Uh, we then uh, use the master equation for capacitances. If, if you know the charge on the plates, you can figure out the voltage between the plates. If you know the uh, voltage on the plates, which we did here, you can figure out the charge on the plates. And you can always uh, then infer the electrical field because that's related to the electrical potential. Okay, that was fun. Uh, I did just want to mention the biggest capacitors that I know of. They're not, you know, somebody's built a big one in the basement or something like that. They're natural capacitors. So thunderclouds uh, are massive, truly massive uh, capacitors, meaning that they store thunderclouds between the earth and the thundercloud. They, they don't store, you know, weedy picocoulombs of charge. They literally store hundreds or thousands of coulombs of charge, huge amounts of charge. Um, they don't have, you know, three volts between their plates, between the thunder cloud and the earth. They have a hundred million volts, that sort of scale. So those are, if you want a big, you know, a capacitor storing a lot of charge, has a lot of potential between the plates, you want to think thunder clouds. That's why you get a spark, because sometimes that capacitor breaks down and it discharges and that, that's lightning. So lightning is just a big spark from a big capacitor storing a lot of charge with a lot of potential. That's the way we understand it. You know, like used to be Zeus was responsible for that, but now we know it's just a big old capacitor uh, discharging. Okay, enough of that. I want to talk about circuits involving capacitors now. And we're going to talk about circuits involving capacitors, batteries, and resistors a lot over the next few classes. Uh, I need to change this, don't I? Okay, just a few general words about circuits. I'm sure this is completely redundant, um, but I wanted to say it anyway. Um, uh, electrical circuits uh, are kind of assemblies of electrical components. A capacitor is an electrical component, so is a battery, so is a resistor. They're all electrical components, and a circuit is just an arrangement of them. Um, uh, circuits typically include a source of energy. That might be a battery or it might be plugged into a power outlet. Uh, circuit diagrams are diagrams of how the components in the circuit, the, the battery, the resistor, the capacitor, are laid out, how they're connected to one another. And that connection, those connections to one another determines the characteristics, the properties, the nature of the circuit, and what it does and what it doesn't. And we're going to be talking a lot about circuits with batteries and resistors and capacitors. Okay, here's a few symbols. These are the only ones we need to, today. Uh, this is the symbol for a capacitor in a circuit diagram. So think of it just like a um, cartoon parallel plate capacitor. Here's the terminals on the left and right, and here's the two plates in blue. Here's a symbol for a battery. We're going to use a battery in our circuits today. Um, that looks a little bit about uh, like a, a, the symbol for the capacitor. But actually, uh, the difference is that you see this top, top uh, horizontal line here. Uh, that's long. This lower one here is, is short. And that 
makes it the symbol for a battery. The way I think of it is that, look, the top one, which is longer, I could take a pair of scissors and I could cut it in half and make the plus sign. So that is the positive terminal of the battery. Uh, the bottom horizontal line, that's short. Uh, it's too short for me to cut that in half, uh, so that must be the, the minus sign. It's the negative terminal. And then finally, um, switches. We're going to have circuits with switches on, right? Just like you've got a switch on your phone, or we've got a switch on the lights. Uh, there's a switch going to be in our circuits, and the switch can be open. Here it is. That circuit is open. The switch can be closed. Here it is. That circuit is closed complete. Okay, let's get on to the capacitors. Wanna, wanna talk about two different situations. Uh, a pair of capacitors being in parallel with one another, a pair of capacitors being in series with one another. So in building circuits, um, we're gonna be making circuits out of assemblies of capacitors and we, and we need to deal with the different arrangements of capacitors and basically dealing with the different arrangements of capacitors comes down to dealing with the particular case of a pair of capacitors in parallel to one another. I'll say in detail what that means. And a pair of capacitors in series to one another. I'll say more about what that means. So once we know how to deal with capacitors in parallel, once we know how to deal with capacitors in series, we can analyze circuits involving capacitors. So that's the goal here. Uh, the first case I'm going to look at is capacitors in, in parallel. So here's a cartoon uh, of two capacitors in parallel connected to a battery. And here's the circuit diagram, we just introduced this, using the circuit diagram symbols of two capacitors in parallel connected to a battery. What parallel means is that, what parallel means is that if you look at these two left-hand terminals of the two capacitors, they're just connected by wires. If you look at the right-hand terminals, they're, they're just connected by, by wires. So that makes them in parallel. Um, another way to think about whether it's in parallel or series is supposing, imagine I'm an electron. Imagine you're an electron. You're walking out of the negative terminal of the battery uh, because you're an electron. You've got to make a choice whether you're going to go over towards this lower capacitor or this upper capacitor. You can't go towards both. So that makes it a, a, a parallel circuit. Okay, so our question is going to be, we've made a circuit with two capacitors in parallel. What is the single capacitor I could replace those two capacitors with that would store the same amount of charge as is stored on the two capacitors for the same voltage applied to the two capacitors. So I'm asking the question, I'm going to tear off those two capacitors C1 and C2. I want to replace them with a third capacitor. I'm going to call it the equivalent capacitor. Uh, and I want it to store, say the, store the same charge for the same voltage. What is the value of that capacitor? What is the equivalent capacitance of this circuit? So that's a, an important question. And it'll lead us to some sort of understanding of the circuit and also an equation for the equivalent capacitance of parallel capacitors. Whoops. Okay, so this, this slide, I, I, I redrew the, the circuit involving the two capacitors and I redrew the circuit diagram of the two, two capacitors. All I've added is a couple of key points about this parallel circuit that I wanted to that I wanted to stress. So the key thing about the the parallel circuit is that the voltage across the two capacitors, so I call them C1 and C2, I call their voltages V1, V2. Their voltage is the same. That's just because you know they're connected by wires on the left, they're connected by wires on the right. So the voltage across them is the same, V1 equals V2, and that's going to be the voltage across the equivalent capacitor. So the equivalent capacitance voltage, I'm going to call it V, is equal to V1 and is equal to V2. They're all the same. 
So that's the first bullet or key point. The second bullet or key point is that um, the two capacitors, well, C1 and C2 are going to store some charge. I called it Q1 and Q2. The total charge that's stored by the equivalent capacitance that I'm just going to call Q without the subscript, that's going to be the total charge stored by the individual capacitor. It's going to be the sum of Q1 and Q2. So um, this key here says that the voltage across the equivalent capacitor is the same across the individual capacitances. The charges on the in equivalent capacitor is the sum of the charges on the two individual capacitors. And that's really the key to understanding the circuit. Based on that understanding, you can prove, I actually did it right down here. I don't want to, I, I know, you know, what is the thing you most like in a physics class? You just like proofs and derivations. So, but I wanted to try and not go into the details of this proof. But it is very straightforward. It's just sitting down here. Um, the equivalent capacitance that stores the, the same amount of charge for the same electrical potential is simply the sum, the numerical sum of C1 and C2. The equivalent capacitance is just C1 plus C2. It's as simple as that when the capacitors are in parallel. It tells you a couple of interesting things. When you put a pair of capacitors in parallel, you make a bigger capacitance, something that's more able to store charge. So that's one important point. Um, also, I should say that this applies not only for just two capacitors in parallel, that the that the equivalent capacitances is the sum of the capacitances. It applies to three or four or five or more capacitors in parallel. To get the total capacitance, the equivalent capacitances of three in parallel, just add up the three capacitances. If you've got four in parallel, just add up the four capacitances. And so it's a rule that I figured out for a pair of capacitances, but it applies to any number of capacitances in parallel. If you want to imagine how this could be, rather than, you know, I, I didn't really want to think about that proof of it, mathematical proof of it. Here's how it could be. Here I've got two capacitors in parallel to one another. You know, the left-hand terminals are attached to one another, the right-hand terminals are attached to one another. This is a parallel arrangement. My, my capacitors here have certain areas of their plates, se certain separations between their plates, certain capacitances determined by the areas and the separations. And here I am, I'm just going to push them together. I'm just going to pull the top one down, push the bottom one up, squeeze them together till they touch. What have I done? I, the magician, has made a new capacitor out of the two original capacitors, a new capacitor that has the same plate separation but has twice the area of the plates. I've made a capacitor that's double the size. And so this is an example, this is an illustration that if you have these two capacitors, two individual ones, upstairs and downstairs, and stick them together, then that makes a bigger capacitance that is the sum of their individual capacitances. So that's how the derivation works, basically, how the formula works. Any questions on that? Because that's the end of um, the parallel. Let's, let's talk about the other case then, series case. Let's get on with that. Um, here's a series capacitor circuit. Here's a, a, a cartoon of the circuit, and here's the circuit diagram invo involving uh, um, uh, symbols for capacitances and batteries. What we mean by parallel is that, um, is this arrangement here of capacitances. What it means is that if you're supposing I'm an electron, I'm going to run around the entire circuit somehow uh, back to the other terminal. So I'm going to run out of the negative terminal back to the positive terminal. In a series circuit, I would have to run through both components. In a parallel circuit, I would run through one or the other. In a series circuit, I run through both. As I run around the circuit from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. And that's what we mean by series. So that's a series circuit. What's the capacitance, the equivalent capacitance, 
of these two capacitors in series. So again, what is the single capacitor that I could replace these two with that for the same applied voltage across the plates of the equivalent capacitors would store the same amount of charge as the equivalent capacitor, as the original capacitors? So we want to answer that question. Again, there's two keys to answering that question. I've got them on this slide. Um, here are the two keys. So the first key is that the capacitor on the left and the capacitor on the right, and actually the equivalent capacitor that is equivalent to the network of the two capacitors, they all store the same amount of charge. Now, you might think, well, how did I come to that conclusion that C1 and C2 store the same amount of charge? One way of understanding it, one way of thinking about it, is to think about this little section in here of wire between the left hand, right hand plate of C1 and the left hand plate of C2. So it's this little stretch from C1's right hand plate to um, C2's left hand plate. Just think about that bit. Think about that bit and think about switching on the circuit, connecting the circuit to the battery. If this plate over here becomes, becomes negatively charged, electrons are, are accumulated here, then this plate over here must become positively charged. And the amount of negative charge on this plate here on, on the right of C1 must be exactly equal and opposite to the amount of charge on this left-hand plate of C2. Uh, that's because this little bit of the circuit is completely isolated. You can move, if you start with it being neutral, you can move some electrons from the, from the right to the left. But however many electrons you move from the right to the left, you, you've left behind a corresponding opposite amount of charge on the, um, on, the, on the plate on the right. And so that tells you that whatever you store on this capacitor, the charge, must be equal to whatever the charge you store on this capacitor. So that's a, an argument that uh, leads to this conclusion. And it's also the charge that is stored on the equivalent capacitor. Second key point. We've applied the battery's voltage, terminal voltage, across the two capacitors. Because they're in series, they, they share that voltage. One of them gets some fraction of it, the other gets the remaining fraction of it. So that the total voltage across the two capacitors is the terminal voltage of the battery. So they're sharing the voltage. The voltage across the equivalent capacitor is the sum of the voltages across the individual capacitors. These rules are basically the opposite of the rules for the parallel capacitor. In, in each case, Somebody's, something's being shared, it could be charge or it could be voltage, uh, and something's the same, it could be charge and voltage. In parallel capacitor, they uh, had the same voltages. Here, they, they share the same amount of charges. In the parallel capacitors, uh, they, they, shared, they, they shared the charge, and here they're sharing the voltage. So those are the fundamental differences. Anyway, based on that, you can prove that the equivalent capacitance that stores the same amount of charge for the same uh, voltage uh, is related to the individual capacitances by this little equation here. I, I proved it down here, but let's just talk about this equation here. This equation says it's not that the equivalent capacitance is the sum of the individual capacitances. It says that the reciprocal of the in, um, equivalent capacitance. So one over the capacitance is equal to the sum of the two, the reciprocals of the two individual capacitances. So one over C1 plus one over C2. There's a very interesting equation. And it just comes out of those ideas of, you know, them both having the same voltages, the, 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 them sharing the voltages, but all having the same charges. This equation is interesting because what it tells you is if you put capacitors together in, in um, series, you make a smaller capacitance. 
If you put capacitors in series together, you're going to increase the inverse of the capacitance, which actually means that you decrease the capacitance. So this is the way that you would make smaller capacitance. You would put capacitors together in series with one another. You can even understand this with our magician, right? Over here, we've got two individual capacitors. Uh, they've got certain plate separations. They've got uh, certain plate areas. And I'm just going to push them together. Now, this time, I'm not going to push one up and one down. I'm going to push uh, the one on the left towards the right, the one on the right towards the left. And I'm going to push them so that they're, 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 the plates that are closest just sort of compress and vanish. What have I done? I've made a new single equivalent capacitor. It's going to have the same plate area, right? This plate here is the left-hand plate of the capacitor on the left. This plate here is the right-hand plate of the capacitor on the right. But it has double the separation. We've got a, this thickness plus this thickness. Double the separation means half the capacitance. And so I've decreased the capacitance by putting these two capacitors in, in series to one another. OK. Everybody OK with that? Good. Everybody not OK with this? Um, we've got to figure out the capacitance, the equivalent capacitance of this circuit. This looks like a monster. Right, we've got four capacitances or in, in some, some funny arrangement that is neither parallel nor series. You know, it contains both parallel and series arrangements. So as a whole, it is neither a simple parallel or a simple series circuit. And uh, our job is to um, figure out the, the capacitance of this entire arrangement. What single capacitor uh, could I replace C1, C2, C3, C4 with? and store the same amount of charge for the same voltage. So I want to figure this out. OK, I'm going to do this one on the slides, because if I tried to draw it on the, the, the thing over there, I mean, it, we would be here through the next class and the class after that. It just take way too long to draw it all out. Uh, so I put it on my slides. How are we going to go about this? Well, um, this is going to be an illustration of how you typically apply series and parallel laws for capacitances to an electrical circuit. What you do is you break the circuit up into kind of sub-circuits where you can apply those laws. Uh, you can apply the laws for uh, series capacitors or par uh, parallel capacitors. And then gradually you work your way through the, cir through the circuit and these sort of sub-circuits to figure out the overall equivalent capacitance. Let me show you how this works. In this circuit, there are two capacitors upstairs here that are simply in parallel with one another. C1 and C2 are in parallel with one another. And there's actually also two capacitors downstairs here that are also simply in parallel with one another. C3 and C4 are in parallel with one another. My first step in finding the equivalent capacitance is that I'm going to replace C1 and C2 with a single equivalent capacitance that for the same voltage would say, store the same charge. So I'm going to replace it with what I call C12 because it's equivalent to capacitor 1 and 2. And the rule for equivalent capacitors uh, uh, when you have a, a parallel circuit like this is that the um, Equivalent capacitance is just the sum of the individual capacitances. So look, this is easy. 1 plus 5 microfarads is 6 microfarads. So I'm going to replace um, these two with C12, that's 6 microfarads. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing downstairs here. I've got two capacitors in, in parallel with one another. I'm going to replace C3 and C4 with a... I turned the lights off with my butt somehow. <laughs> Um, I mean, I've dialed people that way, but, um, okay. 
watch out for that in the future. Um, I have no idea what I was talking about. Uh, <laughs> I was talking about this circuit here. So the equivalent capacitance to C3 and C4, because they're in parallel, I'm going to call it C3-4, is simply the uh, sum of these two capacitances. So it's, it's 4 plus 8, which is 12, 12 microfarads. Mm -hmm. And so this is um, the equivalent capacitance of the, this pair. So that, that wasn't so bad once we broke the circuit up into little sub-pieces, sub-components. Uh, that's what I've re how I've redrawn this circuit now. So this was the single equivalent capacitance to capacitors 1 and 2, and this is single equivalent capacitance to capacitors uh, 3 and 4. They were the 6 microfarads, and the 12 microfarads are calculated on the last slide. Now, oh, th this is getting nice, I've just got two capacitors in series with one another. Well, this is another problem I can solve. When I've got two capacitors in series with one another, the reciprocal of the equivalent capacitance is equal to the reciprocal uh, some of the reciprocals of the individual capacitances. And so um, the overall equivalent capacitance of this pair of capacitors is going to be equal to 1 over C12 plus 1 over C34. So that's going to be that's going to be 1 over 6 plus 1 over 12. So 1 over 6 plus 1 over 12 is like 2 over 12 plus 1 over 12. 2 over 12 plus 1 over 12 is 3 over 12. Uh, I've got to take the inverse of 3 over 12. Uh, the inverse of 3 over 12 is 12 over 3. Uh, and uh, 12 divided by 3 is 4. So the answer should be, yeah, 4 microfarads is the equivalent capacitance. That's the equivalent capacitance of the entire network. So it wasn't so hard after all. Look, I even added a little bit of detail down here. Once you know the equivalent capacitance in this circuit, well, the voltage across its plates will be this 24 volts, and the charge on its plates will be, well, from the master equation for capacitances, well, the charge on its plates will be its capacitance times the voltage across its plates. So this is 4 microfarads times 24 volts. 24 volts. 4 times 24 is 96. That's 96 microfarads. So at this point, I know the equivalent capacitance. I also know the voltage across it. I know the charge on it. I know everything about it. And so that's a, um, in, in those couple of little steps, the series step, the parallel step, I've, I've solved the problem of the equivalent capacitance and how much charge uh, is storing, how much voltage is across its plates. Everybody okay with that? Okay. There was a second part of the question that was mentioned on the question slide. Uh, the first part was finding the equivalent capacitance, and we've done that now. Uh, the second part was, think about, go back to the four individual capacitors, C1, C2, C3, C4. Um, what are the charges that each of them store? What are the potentials across each of them? So that's actually eight separate questions. Four charges on the four capacitors, C1 through C4. Four potentials across the four capacitors, um, uh, C1 through C4. So I've, I've, I'm being asked eight questions in one go here. Um, let's see if we can solve that. Now, if you go about it the right way, we can get it done by at noon. <laughs> go about it the wrong way, we're going to be here this afternoon. So let's see how fast I can strategize this and get through this question. We remember, we want all the voltages and all the... Um, we want all the voltages and... Um, all the, all the charges are on the plates of the capacitor. So let's see if we can do this. Uh, I, sorry, I jumped a slide there. This is where we're going to start. I'm going to go back to this sub-circuit. Remember this circuit? Um, we met it when we were trying to figure out the equivalent capacitance. This is one where we got these two guys in series, C1, C2, and C3, C, uh, C1, 2, and C3, 4. Now, 
this equivalent capacitance up here, C12, I, I know it's capacitance. This equivalent capacitance down here, C34, I know it's capacitance. But I also know the charge on the plates of these capacitors. Remember I know the charge on the plates of the overall equivalent capacitance was 96 microfarads. That's because these are in series, that's the same as the charge on the plates of these two equivalent capacitances. That's also 96 microfarads. That's a huge help. Since I know for C12 its capacitance and its charge, just use the equation for a capacitor to find the voltage across it. If you do that, that's 16 volts across here. Same thing for C34. Since I know the um, capacitance of C34, and I know the charge on its place, 96 microfarads, just use the equation for um, a capacitor, master equation for a capacitor, to figure out the voltage, and that comes out to be, um, plugging in Q, plugging in C, comes out to be 8 volts. Immediately, just by using C equals Q over V, but re rearranging it for the Vs, I've found that my 24 volts got shared with, with 16 volts upstairs here and with 8 volts downstairs here. Now, that's actually answered four questions. It's answered what is the voltage across C1? What is the voltage across C2? What is the voltage across C3 and C4? Because C1 and C2 that made this capacitor here have the same voltage across them as the equivalent capacitor. So this is just not just 16 volts across C1, 2, it's 16 volts across C1 and C2. So we've answered that pair of questions. Downstairs here, this 8 volts is not just the voltage across C3, 4, but because it was made out of C3 and C4 in parallel, this is the voltage 8 volts across C3 and C4. And so we've answered that, that question. So, look, I've answered uh, four of the eight questions in, in, one, in one step here, really, of thinking about this sub-circuit. So I know all the voltages now. The, the first two capacitors have um, 16 volts across them. Uh, the second two capacitors have um, uh, 8 volts across them. That leads me to this slide, because now, for each of these four capacitors, I know their capacitances, because I was told that in the beginning, so I know C1, C2, C3, C4. I know the voltages across every one of them, 16 volts across the two upstairs, 8 volts across the two downstairs. The only thing I don't know is the charge on the plates of them. So again, I can just use the equation for capacitance. C equals Q over V. I'm going to rearrange it for Q equals CV. And I can apply Q equals CV for the first capacitor, find its charge on its place. Apply C, uh, Q equals CV for the second capacitor, find its charge on its place, and, and so on and so forth. Apply it over here for capacitor number three, capacitor number four. Just re repetition after repetition of C equals Q over V. That's all I did in solving what were the four voltages and what are the four uh, charges. All I ever did was use C equals Q over V. The only strategy in there was how I went about using C equals Q over V, starting with that particular sub-circuit working towards the full circuit. I know I've got to work towards the full circuit because I know I want a circuit with all four capacitors in it. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, the real test of this one, right, is try it, try it on your own, right? Because it is a bit of strategy. You've got to think about it the right way. You've got to strategize about who shares voltages, who shares charge. Those key ideas to solving these circuits. So, last topic. <clears throat> I did say at the very beginning that capacitors store energy as well as charge. We focused on the storing of the charge of capacitors, which is, is natural to do. Um, uh, I want to end up in this last 10 minutes by talking about the, um, the energy that, that, capacitors, that capacitors store. So um, I'm going to uh, say a few words about that. I'm going to show you a little example of it, and then I'm going to show you a demonstration of it just to end up with. 
hopefully. Okay, so here's a simple electrical circuit involving a battery, involving a capacitor, as we've met before. I've added a switch. I added the switch just so I could, you know, have start with the circuit open, where nothing's happened, close the switch, and explore what happened. So uh, when I start with the switch open and close the switch, what happens in regards to the, um, the, the battery and the capacitor and the circuit as a whole? Uh, one way of thinking about it is, well, what happens is that when I close the switch, electrons will flow out of the negative terminal of the battery. So over here on the right-hand side, these electrons are swarmed down the wire and uh, they'll spread themselves out uh, like, kind of like a peanut butter or jam on this plate over here. So this will become negatively charged. On the other hand, uh, electrons on this plate on the left, well, they'll be repelled, so they'll run down, swarm down the wire like little bees uh, but into the positive terminal of the battery, leaving behind a, a positive charge on this plate, a deficit of electrons. And so that's, that's what happens from the perspective of, um, you know, the electrons flowing around, the electrons moving around. That's the action that's going on. But there's another way of thinking about um, what's happening in this circuit without thinking about the movement of the electrons, the flow of the electrons. And let's think about energy. Energy is also moving around. You know, electrons are real physical particles that are moving around. Energy, which is a more abstract quantity, that's also moving around. When you switch on the circuit, there's a transfer of energy. So the battery is a, is a store of chemical energy. And we'll, we'll go more into that in the next classes. But battery is a store of chemical energy. Capacitors, when charged, store electrical energy. They store electrical energy because they have to establish electrical field. They have to establish electrical potential. So there's an energy storage here. When we close that switch, energy is flowing out of the battery and it's being stored on the capacitor. It flows out of the battery, stored on the battery, consistent with energy conservation, right? You, you don't lose any energy, you don't gain any energy. However many joules of energy flowed out of the battery from chemical energy uh, appeared as electrical energy between the plates of the capacitor. And so that's the energy perspective. With that perspective, is, of course, an equation that describes the energy in a capacitor, stored by a capacitor. So like there's an equation to describe the charge stored by the capacitor, it's an equation that stores the energy of the capacitor. Uh, it's this mouthful up here. Now, it's a mouthful. This, this means potential energy of the um, stored in the form of electricity electrical energy. This mouthful is because I wrote the same equation in three different ways. So it depends on the capacitance of the capacitor that, that characterizes your capacitor. It depends on the charge you put on the plates. It depends on the voltage between the plates. Those are three quantities, C, Q, and V. You can write the energy stored in a capacitor in any pair of those three quantities. So if you had three quantities, if you had a blue and a red and a yellow ball, and you had to pick a pair, right? You could, I've forgotten the colors, but um, uh, you, you could pick a red and a blue, you could pick a blue and a yellow, or you could pick a red and a yellow. The same thing here, I can pick a Q and a V, I can pick a C and a V, I can pick a Q and a, v, a C. Uh, and so that's what I've written up here. This is one way of writing the energy stored in a capacitor where we're featuring charge and capacitance. This is another way where we're featuring charge and voltage. This is another way where we're featuring charge and just charge and voltage. Hope I said that right. But anyway, there's three ways of writing the same equation. Look, they're all linked together. You can make one out of the other by C equals Q over V. So you can just, you know, just write down one and, and convert it into any other one you like. Um, this equation applies to all capacitors no matter the shape, the geometry, whether it's a parallel plate or not a parallel plate. Um, a large, it tells you a couple of interesting things. I've put a couple of bullets here. 
when you have a large capacitance, if you have a capacitor with a large capacitance, that means it's, um, there's a small energy cost to storing charge on it. So it doesn't take many joules to store, say, a nanocoulomb of charge. If you have a capacitance that has a small capacitance, that means it's a big energy cost to store charge. It means that to store that nanocoulomb of charge, it's going to cost you a lot more joules if you've got a small capacitance. That's how, that's how these equations work. I got one example here which will lead us into the demonstration. Three capacitors in series with one another, upstairs in green. Three other capacitors, they're the same values, in parallel with one another. Downstairs, should have been in red, but it's coming out in green too. Um, so we've got two circuits here, all involve the same capacitors. They're all actually 2.8 millifarad capacitances. They're sitting here on the bench. In one circuit, they're arranged in series. Uh, this is the series circuit over here on the left-hand side. These are the three capacitors, uh, these blue cylinders. And then in the other circuit, they're arranged in parallel. Uh, this is the parallel arrangement, again, of these three light capacitors. When you arrange three capacitors in series, you make a smaller, smaller capacitance. If I apply a voltage to that, same voltage to that, I'll, I'll store a smaller amount of energy. If I put the capacitors in parallel, that's a bigger capacitance. If I apply the same voltage to the three capacitors in, in parallel, uh, I'll store more energy. I, I plugged in some numbers here, and for the capacitances on the bench, for the voltages I'm going to apply, um, I found out I store two joules in this case of the smaller capacitance and 20 joules in this case. So by having three capacitances, either in parallel or series, I can store 10 times more energy or 10 times less energy. I want to show you, show you this. So I'm going to charge these capacitors up. I'm going to do it with the, um, the, the series one first. So this is not going to store too much energy. I'm going to turn the voltage up. Now, I've got to wait 30 seconds. I've got to wait 30 seconds because these capacitors are kind of slow, they're old, uh, and I'm waiting for all those electrons to run onto the plates of the capacitors. I'm charging this one up over here. I'm not getting too close. Um, this one is the series arrangement. We figured out this is going to have a smaller capacitance. It's going to store less energy when I apply my 40 volts. I'm applying 40 volts to it. Um, I'm going to dis now store charge on it. I'm going to disconnect it from uh, m my power supply, my battery, and I'm going to discharge it. A little bit of a spark. That little bit of spark was a little bit of energy that's stored in those three batteries. Uh, I apologize if you couldn't see it. Um, but you'll see the next one better. Um, OK, now I'm going to do the same thing with the circuit over here. I'm going to charge up uh, this arrangement of the three parallel resistors. Um, I already made a mistake. It's going to kill me for this. Um, I meant to turn the voltage gently down, then turn the switch, and then turn it back up. But I forgot to do all of that. I just flipped the switch. Um, that's why I heard a big bang under the bench. Um, now, uh, I'm, and again, I'm just talking so I can wait 30 seconds to charge up these three capacitors. These are in parallel. They're going to store more energy. We might get a bigger spark. That'll be fun. Um, so hopefully they're charged up right now. Give it another few seconds. Open this up. Um, discharge. And we get a bigger spark. So that's 20 joules of energy. And so this is an illustration, if you want to take home with you, that these capacitors